Our passage tonight is going to be in Romans chapter 2. You can see from your bulletin, uh, verses 12 through 16 is what we're going to look at. But just real quick before we get into the passage tonight, just as a really quick follow-up to what John was talking about. I just love the opportunity that we get uh, to highlight members of our congregation here who are doing missions work. And it's not just John who has a heart for this and who is going and doing things like this. Uh, There's others among us who often do things like this. And I like to take the chance, I hope it's encouraging for you to, to hear from them. And I know there are probably others in here who have a heart for missions, uh, especially overseas missions. You may not have the opportunity to actually go for one reason or another, but there's plenty of other just as important opportunities for you to get involved if you would like to. So if you find yourself encouraged and your heart is stirred, and this is something that you'd like to follow up on, or maybe you've never been involved and you'd like to, We'd like to help you out with that. Even if you can't actually go, there's plenty of other opportunities that you can have. So come talk to me. Uh, You can talk to John. I know he'd love to, you know, tell you how you could be involved, but this is something that that a whole church can get their arms around, and I I think we should, and it's it's pleasing to our Lord in advancing of his kingdom, Uh, not just here in our community, but around the world. So like I said, Tonight, we're going to get into a passage in Romans chapter 2, and I was thinking about this as I was getting ready this week and looking back through this passage. The book of Romans is, if you ask a lot of uh, Christians, a lot of people sitting in churches, what your favorite book of the Bible is, I think there's a lot, if they've been in church for a while, who would say, yeah, Romans is, is one of my favorite books, it is my favorite book. There's a lot of reasons for that. I think the book of Romans has, honestly, a lot of, I don't know what to call them other than than highlights. There's these passages when it comes to the book of Romans that if you're familiar with the scriptures, your mind kind of gravitates to. The one that we're looking at tonight is not one of those, to be honest with you. I think if you look through, you know, if you go to like Sermon Audio or, you know, one of those Sermon Archive websites or something like that, and you just run a search on Romans, I would venture a guess that the first 100 passages that you come across of sermons would not be on chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. Honestly, that's a shame. It's a, it's a really critical passage in our understanding, and as, as I've studied it again this week and and gotten back into it, I found it to be just a really encouraging and wonderful passage. So we're going to try here in the next 30 minutes or so to get our minds around this and to really understand this passage and its truths and how it speaks to us today. In order to do that, I think it would be good to have just a quick reminder of exactly what the book of Romans is and and what what it is about Book of Romans, as many of you understand, was written by the Apostle Paul. Now, the book of Romans, this letter, is unique in that it is the only New Testament letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church that he had neither had a hand in establishing or had never visited personally. And so it really helps to look at the book of Romans when you understand that he is writing to a group of people who he knows by name, he knows their reputation as a church, and likewise they know him and his reputation, but he doesn't know them personally. Now, he writes this letter, he's very clear if we go back uh, to chapter 1 and you read back through chapter 1, that he's using this letter, sending it ahead of himself, because he hopes one day to visit the church of Rome, and he actually says, I have tried to get there, But, you know, I've just been prevented. Now, probably it wasn't COVID shutting down borders and stuff in his case, at least not that we know of, but various circumstances prevented him from reaching the Church of Rome. But he says, look, I'm really, really trying to get there. If you read, or if we look at chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, he said, I want you to know that I've often intended to come to you, but have thus far been prevented. And in verse 15, he says, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you, who are in Rome. And so he's using this letter to the Romans to kind of introduce himself to say, hey, I'm looking forward to the visit, and when I come, 
here's kind of what you can expect. So in order to lay the foundation for his upcoming visit that he hopes to make, he uses the bulk of this letter to the church in Rome in the first century to outline and preach the gospel message that is the foundation and the motivation of his ministry as the greatest missionary that the church has ever known to this date, and his ministry as an apostle. So the gospel kind of forms the backdrop for his introduction to these people. The book of Romans then is an in-depth exposition and an argument for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we talk about the gospel We know the word literally means good news. It's the good news. A message of love and mercy for forgiveness of sins and eternal life for all who will hear and respond in repentance and faith. C.S. Lewis, the, the great Christian author, referred to the gospel as an unspeakable comfort, which I think we would agree on. The thing is, The gospel can only be a comfort if there is something to be comforted from, right? In this case, as we come now to chapter 2, verses 12 through 16, the fact that all mankind, every man, woman, and child who has ever lived, stands before God guilty and deserving of what chapter 1 talks about, His righteous judgment against sin. That's what we need comfort and encouragement from. The teaching of the Scriptures that we all stand before God as guilty sinners. We looked a couple of weeks ago at chapter 2, verse 2. It says, We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things, the, 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 the sinful hearts and attitudes that Paul goes through in chapter 1. And so we come to chapter 2, verses 12 through 16 tonight. It's a message of judgment, okay, but we know that that is not where it stops, because within the judgment lies comfort. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to read chapter 2, verse 12, and that's where we're going to start. It says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. And right away we see that's harsh, disturbing wording, right? We see words like, they will perish. And we see words like, they will be judged. That's not words, that's not language that we like to hear. That doesn't make us comfortable, right? Chapter 12 starts, I'm sorry, verse 12 starts with the word for or because. Looking back to the previous verses. Namely, verse 11 of chapter 2 that says, God shows no partiality. It's the last sentence in that entire paragraph that starts with verse 6 that talks about God's judgment, God's righteous judgment that will fall on all those who reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. You reject the gospel, you will pay for your own sins. Hey, this is the teaching of Scripture, not just in the book of Romans, but all throughout Scripture. And Paul writes, he says in verse 11, he says, God is the judge that shows no partiality. And then we come to verse 12 that says, because, because of this, all who have sinned Without the law will perish, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. He's talking about the law. When he talks about the law here, what he is specifically talking about is the law of Moses. What we think of back in Exodus chapter 20 as the Ten Commandments and all the ceremonial laws that come out of it. Paul talks about those who have sinned against the law, and he's talking about those or talking about those who have sinned without the law. He's talking about the Jew, the Jewish person, the descendant of Abraham, who received the law of Moses and knew it. He's talking about the non-Jew, or what the, the Gentile, okay, who is outside 
of God's chosen people, Israel, and who did not have the benefit of getting the written law of Moses. He's speaking to both groups in chapter 2, verses 12 through 16. And Paul starts his argument here, or he starts his teaching here in 12 through 16 with a question. As he states, everyone who has sinned, the Jew who has the law who has sinned, is guilty before God. The non-Jewish person who has sinned is just as guilty. He anticipates the question of his audience, well, how then can God be impartial? How then can God judge everyone? How can God impartially declare that everyone who has ever lived is guilty and deserving of his judgment against sin? If we go back, or if you go back and look at chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, it clearly states that all men are responsible to God and will be judged by him. Now, it's almost as if here Paul kind of has in his mind. A, a hypothetical audience. Hey, he imagines, first of all, that there's a, a Jew who hears about God's income or oncoming judgment for sin. And the Jew looks around and says, Boy, I'm glad that I'm Jewish. I'm glad that I have the law of Moses because I'm not going to be judged. It's those non believing Gentiles, those heathens that are going to be judged. And Paul argues here, No. Religious Jew, religious person, you are just as guilty before God. And he anticipates the non-religious Gentile who says, well, you know what? I'm glad that you said that, but I don't know anything about a law. Hey, I don't know the law of Moses. I wasn't given this. Hey, I'm ignorant. Hey, therefore, I'm not responsible. God can't hold me responsible for things that I didn't know. And Paul looks at this person through the power of the Holy Spirit, and says, no, you're just as guilty. And you just as much need salvation. And here's why. So the premise here is both the Jew and the non-Jew, the Gentile, are equally as guilty before God because both of them, whether they are the religious Jew who had the law of Moses or the non-religious Gentile who did not have the benefit of the written law. Both know the requirements of God's law, and they fail to do them. We look at verse 12, and we're going to have just four simple points tonight that we're going to work through very quickly here. Paul actually starts his argument with this in verse 12 with the verdict. If we're thinking about this as a trial in a court of law, normally the verdict comes last. But the way that Paul builds his case in verses 12 through 16, he actually starts with the verdict first and then explains it. The verdict is that every man who has ever lived is guilty and stands deserving of God's judgment. It doesn't matter if you know the law of Moses or not. If you are religious, quote-unquote, or non-religious, you're guilty. Apart from Christ, both the Jew and the non-Jew will be condemned, Paul argues, at the final judgment because of their clear violations of God's law. The non-Jewish person will not automatically be saved or spared judgment because he didn't have the law and so didn't break it. What we'll see is he sinned against the law, the light that he does have. And the Jewish person that had the law of Moses cannot claim that he will automatically be saved because God has just given him the law. Yes, he knows the law. He was given the law. But... He has not kept it. He sinned against it. You see, the the premise here, the, the key understanding is that sin always brings judgment. It doesn't matter our social, our economic condition, our position in life, even our position in relationship to the local church. Sin brings judgment. And so that's the verdict that's laid out there right away. 
And now as he anticipates or as he thinks through his audience and what their reaction might be, again, remember, he doesn't know them personally. Okay, so he's left to just kind of anticipate, okay, if I were there and I were hearing this, here's what I would be thinking. And so he goes on to write number two. In verse 13, we see the reason for the religious Jews' guilt. See, verse 13 says, It's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. He looks at the religious person in his audience, in this case a Jew, who's looking around going, boy, I'm glad that I have the law of Moses. I'm glad that I'm going to be spared from judgment. And his point is, it's not the knowledge of the law that saves. It's not your position, but it's rather the doing of the law. And the thing is, no one does the law. If we'd skip ahead, and we will really quickly here, to Romans chapter 3, a familiar passage, verses 9 through 12. Look at at what the Scriptures say. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off than than the Gentiles and these wicked people that you look at as, as heathen sinners? No, not at all. For we have already charged that everyone, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, no one is righteous, No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Everyone has turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. From the perspective of God and His righteous law, the Scriptures are rather clear. There is no one who has ever lived who has kept the law of God perfectly. And Paul writes in verse 13, it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. That word justified, that is a word that refers to God declaring a sinner not guilty. It's a a legal act. It's a declaration. When God looks at a sinful human being and says, you are not guilty, you will not suffer judgment for your sins, that is justification. And what Paul says in verse 13 is it is the doers of the law, not just the mere hearers, not just the ones who receive it and say, boy, I'm glad, I, I'm glad that I have that, who are made righteous before God, but those who actually do the law. Now, there's a couple of different ways when it talks about doers of the law, a couple of different ways that this can be taken. And if you look at various commentaries, you'll see it's kind of split right down the middle. There are some who argue that the doer here in verse 13 is the one who has placed faith in Christ and his life, death, and resurrection, his fulfillment of the law, and thus they have done the law by placing their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There are those who argue that this is a statement that if someone perfectly obeys the law of God, it would lead to salvation from God's wrath and the final judgment with the understanding that no one does. And so it's just reinforcing the point that all are guilty before God. Now I kind of tend towards the, lean towards the second explanation here, but whether you like the first explanation, the first interpretation, or the second, ultimately for the sake of our passage, it does not matter because you end up right at the same spot. You and I might take different roads to get there, but we're going to get to the same destination. Hey, the main point is the same. The religious Jew's privileged position and knowledge of the law is not enough to save him from judgment on its own. The fact that he has received the law of Moses, that he has a privileged position of the Jew, as a Jewish person, it doesn't matter when it comes to final judgment. Because yes, you may have it, but you've transgressed it. There is no one who has kept the law perfectly. In our vernacular today, if we're going to take this and pull it into our society, in our culture, in our thinking today, we might say, but I grew up in church. I'm a good person for the most part. You know, I do the best that I can. I read the Bible. Yes, but none none of that on its face is enough to save us from judgment for our sins. Mere knowledge of God's law or the outward trappings of religion do not bring 
salvation. Being a moral person, having a privileged position, going to church, knowing the Bible, even reading it sometimes, does not save. Even because the most moral person among us has not obeyed God's commandments perfectly. We have all sinned. We're all guilty lawbreakers. The only person who has ever walked on the face of this earth who has kept the law of God perfectly is Jesus Christ. It's not me. It's not you. It's only Him. So in this, the Jew is just as guilty. The religious Jew is in the same boat as the non-religious Gentile. And both are judged equally. The outwardly religious Jew is just as guilty as the non-religious Gentile. So Paul addresses this person, the religious person, in verse 13. In verses 14 and 15, he turns now his attention to the non-religious, to the non-Jew, or we would say the Gentile. Verse 14 says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they don't have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. So now he turns his attention to the person in his audience who says, well, you know what? I mean, I, I agree with you. You know, that, you know, that Jewish person, he's transgressed the law and, you know, that's really bad. But hey, you know what? I didn't, have, I didn't know. I didn't have the law. Hey, how can God judge me? He says, whoa, wait a minute here. Think with me. Verse 14, he explains that even the non-believing, heathen, pagan, non-law-observing Gentile acknowledges and obeys the things required by the law even though he did not receive it in its written form like the Jew did. Hey, well, how is this the case? The, the, the Gentile, the argument here is the non-religious person even though he may not know the Scriptures, even though he may not have the same written law that the Jew had, he has the light within him, and he has sinned against that light. We see the source of this in verse 15. He says, They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Paul argues, No, you may not have the written law, but... You have the law of God written on your heart. You have a knowledge of the law. And you've sinned against that knowledge. Because even the Gentile, the non-Jewish person, the person who had not been given the law, is created by God. And as we see in Genesis chapter 1, bears His image. However flawed that is now because of sin. And so everyone, both Jew and Gentile alike, has a knowledge of God. We saw that in chapter 1, right? It says the things that are known about God have been clearly seen so that they are without excuse. Every man who has ever lived has a knowledge of God imprinted on their very nature. And by virtue of bearing the image of God, of being more like God than any other part of the rest of creation... There is a basic knowledge of what God is like and what God expects. We even see it if we pull this into our thinking and our culture today. If you look around, hey, we understand that generally in society, people have an understanding of basic right and wrong, right? There are, all, there are certain things that we all agree on. Whether it's somebody that comes to Lakeside Community Chapel or somebody who has never been to church in their life. There's a basic understanding, right? For example, that, that, that murder is wrong. It's wrong to steal. It's wrong to lie. To be unfaithful to your spouse. It's wrong to be a pedophile. Hey, now you say, well, not everybody thinks those things. Yes, but we understand that even those in our, for our society that, that might not seem to agree on these basic things, we understand that that's abnormal. 
right? Generally speaking, hey, human beings have a basic idea that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And this is what the Apostle Paul is pointing at for his argument. We mentioned C.S. Lewis earlier. I know that some of you have probably read his book, Mere Christianity, and are familiar with it. Hey, he actually remarks on this and, and I think makes a really good illustration that I think is helpful in understanding tonight. He, he kind of uses the illustration of a couple of unbelievers to make the point here and what, how they react when one of them feels as if he has been wronged okay, or treated unjustly by another. And he writes this. He says, the man who makes these remarks or who approaches somebody else because he feels like he's been mistreated, he's appealing to some kind of standard of behavior which he expects the other man to know about. And the other man very seldom replies, to hell with your standard. Nearly always he tries to make out that which he has been doing does not really go against the standard, or if it does, there is some special excuse. He pretends that there is some special reason in this particular case why the person who took the seat first should not keep it, or that things were quite different when he is given the bit of orange, or that something is turned up which lets him off keeping his promise. It looks, in fact, very much as if both parties had in mind some kind of law or rule of fair play or decent behavior or morality or whatever you like to call it about which they really agreed. And they have. If they had not, they might, of course, fight like animals, but they could not quarrel in the human sense of the word. Quarreling means trying to show that the other man is in the wrong, and there would be no sense in trying to do that unless you and he had some sort of agreement as to what right and wrong are, just as there would be no sense in saying that a footballer, or we would say soccer player, had committed a foul unless there was so, uh, some agreement about the rules of football. Okay, so what he, the point he is making here is that all of us, again, generally speaking, saved and unsaved, religious, non-religious, okay, God-fearer or atheist, have a basic knowledge in and of ourselves of right and wrong. Where did that come from? It comes from the fact that you're created in God's image and you bear that image, even though you're still a guilty sinner. And so Paul writes about the result here of this in verse 15 He says, because of this, their conscience bears witness against them and their thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Because the non-religious Gentile has the image of God, has a basic understanding of his law and has sinned against him, Paul writes, your conscience is your witness. Your conscience accuses you. Deep within yourself, you know that you have done wrong, that you have sinned, that you are guilty. And so he comes then to verse 16. He comes to the sentencing for both religious Jew and non-religious Gentile. Verse 16 says, On that day, when according to my gospel, the gospel that he had been given by Jesus Christ himself, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. The thoughts of everyone, the thoughts, the conscience, the motivations of everyone who has ever lived, ultimately act as a testimony and a lawyer at the final judgment of Christ where everything will be revealed and laid bare. The thoughts and motives of everyone's hearts will be revealed when God judges all men through Christ. And so we come to this sentence. Paul speaks about the day of judgment. That day when everyone who has ever lived, both religious and non-religious, who have not accepted God's gracious offer of forgiveness and salvation through the gospel of Christ, will be condemned by the law that they knew but chose to transgress. Whether they had received it in written form as the Jewish person and sinned against it, or whether they had sinned against the law of God that He had graciously given in their hearts and imprinted with His image, All are guilty. As we talked about back in verse 13, the doers of the law, there's only one who has ever lived, who has ever kept the law of God perfectly, and that is the God-man Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, lived a perfect human life, died a sinner's death that he did not deserve, and rose again on behalf of sinners so that anyone who trusts in his life, death, and resurrection will be saved and will be forgiven. 
because he stands in their place. Now we've looked at this passage tonight. So we ask, so what? How does that affect me? How do we think about this? Again, thinking about the big picture of the book of Romans. Paul introducing himself to the book of Romans, outlining, defending the gospel that had been given to him personally by Jesus Christ. How does this affect us? Let's look look back at verse 13. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. It's the big question for each one of us. Hey, when we stand before God one day, will it be in our sins or will we be justified through our faith in Jesus Christ? Again, justification is a word that points to the act of God in which He declares a sinner to be not guilty. And God can justify a sinner and still be righteous because of the work of Jesus Christ who bore the judgment that was due sinners when He died on the cross in their place. See, we talked a lot tonight about guilt and judgment. And again, like we said, those are words that naturally make us feel uncomfortable. But that's not a complete summary of the gospel message, right? Knowing, a, knowing God just as judge is not the gospel message. Because this is a snapshot, this is a key component of the gospel, but this is not all. Because if we go on to read in the book of Romans, chapter 5, verse 8, that God shows His love for us in that when we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because yes, God is the righteous judge, but this righteous judge is also more loving than anyone in here can fathom. And the Scriptures tell us that He is not willing that any would come into judgment, but He wants all men to repent, and He gives us that opportunity to be saved. The same God who is judge is the God who delights and loves to forgive and to bestow mercy. And so the Gospel is everyone who places their faith and trust in the death and resurrection of Christ for forgiveness of sins will be justified, will be declared righteous and free from judgment. And that is why C.S. Lewis calls the Gospel the great comfort. Because it is. But you can't have comfort without having the bad news first. But when we understand the bad news, that we are all guilty, religious, non-religious, privileged, non-privileged, Hey, when we understand that news that we're all guilty and deserving of judgment, but then God offers repent or God offers mercy and forgiveness in Christ to all who will repent, they'll be saved. This should lead us away from attempts to justify ourselves by our works, just as the Jews did, or excuse ourselves as people who don't know what we should do, as the Gentile did. Turn to Christ because salvation is found in Him alone. Now, there's probably those in here tonight who are sitting there going, okay, that's good, I understand that, but I've trusted Christ. I'm a believer. I believe the gospel. I believe the gospel. I've joined the church. Okay, well, this passage also speaks to us tonight. Because often, as believers in Christ, even though we probably wouldn't phrase it this way, we forget the gospel message, don't we? I'm saved. I've believed. I've joined the church. I sit here. I come every Sunday. And we sit on our hands and magically wait for something to happen. To the believer in Christ tonight, to my brothers and sisters in Christ, I would remind us that it's not just like the Jew, just like the religious person. It's not our position in the church or our biblical knowledge, our outward trappings of religion that saved you in the first place or that make you more like Jesus now. But it's only this gospel that we have been pointed back to tonight. It's only the power of God working through the Holy Spirit that will continue to grow, to make you more like Christ, that will help you to love Him more. We would call this our sanctification. Spiritual growth does not come through mere external observances. Your salvation didn't. 
nor does your growth in Christ. Church membership, attendance, none of these things will help you to love Jesus more. Only the work of the Holy Spirit in your life as daily you preach the gospel to yourself. A healthy walk with Christ only comes through a genuine love for Him that results, if we look back at verse 13, in an intentional doing of the law. Now that, again, is not observing the law of Moses. Hey, but rather for us in our context today, obedience to the commands of Christ. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And for us who have been saved, that is the continuation of the gospel in our lives. We have believed it for salvation, and now we believe it for our love for Christ and our growth in Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You, Lord, for Your Word, for the greatness of the Gospel message. And Father, I pray for anyone who is here tonight who has not trusted Christ, who has not believed that Gospel in the first place, that You would work in their hearts, Father, to bring them to faith, that You would open their eyes to their need for a Savior and the fact that they can do nothing to save themselves and that they would trust Him and His work alone for forgiveness of their sins. And I pray for my brothers and sisters who have trusted Christ, who are trusting Him presently right now, tonight. Lord, that You would remind us of the importance of the Gospel. Father, not just for our past salvation, Father, for our salvation from judgment, but for our growth in Christ now. That it's not us, that it's not our works, but it is our love for Christ and our faithful obedience by the power of the Holy Spirit to His commands. So Father, I pray for everyone here tonight that You would take Your Word, everyone who has heard it, and that you would use it in our hearts and lives as you see fit where you know that we need it. Pray that you would bring us all back safely to gather together and worship as a family next Sunday. And we trust everything to you in Jesus' name. Amen.